Here in a little bit, we're going to be in Genesis chapter uh, 11, Genesis chapter 12, and Genesis chapter 15. So if you've got your Bible, there's something you read your Bible on if you want to go ahead and get to that. If not, you can follow on the screen. You can go to our church website, click on the digital bulletin, click on the sermon notes, and you can follow. If you've got the Bible app, you can follow right there in your hand. Um, this is I was thinking and, and reflecting, and like many of you, I, I've been caught this week watching, watching the news. Uh, caught this week kind of, um, what do they call it, doom scrolling through Twitter a lot <laughs> with a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world. And it, it never seems to fail that any time we have major events that go on, so many people start asking questions. They start looking around and they start wondering, well, what, what's the fix for this? Well, what's the solution? Where is the, where's the end of all of these problems? You know, if we think about the, the realm of a world at war, Either it's one side, you got let's impose some sanctions, or let's go drop some bombs, that'll fix them. You know, we got either one of those two, two things there. Um, if it's in the realm of politics, let's elect this man, let's elect this woman, and that'll solve everything, and that always works, right? Or even in the realm of medicine, let's, uh, let's impose some guidelines, let's impose some procedures, and that'll slow it all down. Well, we've been in the middle of COVID now for what, over almost three years now. It, we just know that there's no simple fix. There's no easy solutions to anything in this life. There's no quick fix to what is wrong with our world. You know, we looked at the big issue a few weeks back, and we know that in this world, since the first humans made that choice that they knew better than God how to live the life that he had created and intended for them to live, that the main issue affecting this world has been just that problem. It's been, it's been sin. And today we see the far-reaching consequences of sin. You know, the effects are seemingly running rampant both at home and abroad. Maybe the brokenness in our lives, maybe we don't even feel it anymore. Maybe we're just so conditioned to it that we're like that dog in that burning room you've probably seen online, right? As you sit there in the burning room looking around going, well, this is fine. Maybe sometimes with the brokenness of this world, that's how we feel. We're in a burning room, but everything, everything's good. <laughs> everything's fine. Well, we've been tracing this thread, this uh, this thread through the storyline of Scripture over the past few weeks, and we're going to do this throughout the year. We're going to jump in and out of this series, but the issue of sin and the brokenness that, that came because of it, well, it required more than a quick fix. It required more than an easy solution. There are not enough fig leaves we saw just a couple of weeks back to cover ourselves with. There are not enough shrubs. There are not enough bushes to hide ourselves behind in our sin and shame. You know, we're only a few chapters this week we're on chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 15. We're only a few chapters into this massive collection of books that we call the Bible. And, and we've made it from the beginning time up last week through the story of Noah. And still, if you're following along with me, there's no easy solution that's been found. There's no easy solution to the brokenness of this world that we have found. Things are bad in this good world that God created. And as we've read this story, maybe we ask, when will it change? When will things get better? And today we still ask those same questions, do we not? When will things change? When will things get better? And inevitably people start jumping from there and they start asking the question, God, do you even care about the way this world is today? Maybe we hear ourselves or others asking those questions. And just because we don't see it, just because it doesn't happen exactly at the time and in the way that we want it does not mean that God is not active, does not mean that God is not working the entire time. Hopefully you've been able to trace this thread with me as we've been walking through the Bible. And I think at times we wonder, and maybe we even think that if I were God, well, what I would do is I would snap my fingers and I'd solve all the world's problems. But God doesn't work the way we would work. He doesn't. So we're left with questions. And at times we wrestle, at times we struggle with doubt. What are some of the questions we wrestle with? Well, one of the questions is, is do we really believe that all things will work out? Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that God is in control? Do we really believe that God has our best in mind? Not just tolerates us, not just puts up with us, but that God has our best in mind. And do we really hold on to hope for something greater? That all that we see, that all that we know, that all of life is moving towards something other than the chaos we experience and the mess and the brokenness of this world. Do we believe those things? Do we trust those things? And I, I want to go ahead and tell you this morning, there are times we struggle with the answers to those questions. There are times we wrestle with, with doubt when it comes to answering those questions. We can struggle. We can wrestle with doubt, but it must always point us to God because it all comes down to our trust in Him. And this morning, from the story of a man named Abraham, and we're not even going to get to Abraham this morning. We're going to be stuck with Abram. <laughs> but from the story of a man named Abram this morning, I want to attempt to draw out this big idea 
our obedience to and love for God are wrapped up in how much we trust Him. If we will walk with Him in this life, then we're going to have to trust Him. If all our love with our hearts, our soul, our mind, and our strength are given to this God, we're going to have to trust Him. Not how much we know about Him. We can know all about this book and still not trust Him. Not how much we feel it, because we're not always going to feel it. Not how much He can do this or He can do that, but how much do we trust God? Do we trust Him enough to keep going when we don't know what's on the other side of this step that He's asking us to take? Have you ever been there before? God says, do this, and you're like, well, I can't see where my foot's going to go down over there, God. I don't know if I want to take that step. Do we trust God enough to believe that he'll come through on his promises when it looks like there is no hope? Do we trust God enough to leave behind both convenience and comfort when he says, go? See, these are the calls that people have faced throughout Scripture. And these are the same calls that many of us face in our lives today. Maybe you've already dealt with them. Maybe you've already experienced them in your life, but hopefully we can draw some of this out of the story this morning. Now, back in the olden days, when people exclusively used to watch shows from week to week on TV, you remember these days, right? Back before the days of DVR, back before the days of Netflix. If you were ever going to catch up on a show that had a cliffhanger at the end of one week, maybe it's the end of a series or at the end of a, like a, a season before you get to the next season, what do they always have at the next episode? The recap, right? You would have to bide time watching. Well, I saw all that last week. I don't want to watch that again. Now on Netflix, if you're watching it, they have the skip button. And, and I love the skip button. Anytime the intro comes out, anytime the recap comes out, I don't need to know all that stuff. Skip this. I don't need to listen to the office theme song the 18,000th time. I'm going to skip all this stuff. Well, you can't skip me this morning. <laughs> you can't fast forward Matt this morning because I'm going to give you a recap of where we've been in Scripture. We're going to recap and set the stage for Genesis chapter 12. But we have to get there first. We move from creation to, to how sin is running rampant within this world. The first book of the Bible, we know it, we're in it, it's Genesis. It begins with God creating the heavens, God creating the earth, and God creating everything that moved upon the earth. He created plants, He created animals, and He created us, humans. But He did something different. He created us in His image, in His likeness, to reflect His goodness in the way we work in the way we, we rule, in the way we relate with one another, in the way we even rest, because our rest proves that God is God and we are not, so we don't always have to be doing stuff. We can have a rhythm of work and rest in this life. Well, God looked at that creation, looked at all that he had made, and he called it what? Good. That's how God looked at creation. He said, this is good or very good. The world, as God intended it, was very good. Relationships without tension. Does anybody have a relationship without tension? Work without toil. Uh, just relating with, with creation itself was something that did not have the effects or the consequences of sin. Yet. So harmony on all fronts. And God takes this man and woman in this harmonious world that he has created, and he puts them in this garden to work it, to subdue it, and to take care of it for him. God was taking care of every need they could ever have. And this relationship was so intimate between mankind and their creator that God would regularly come and spend time with them. God had given them ultimate freedom. God had blessed them to go and subdue and to multiply and to fulfill the earth. But he only gave them what? The one prohibition. Do not eat from that one tree. Don't, do not eat from that one tree. So God is asking them, in a sense, to do what? To trust him that he will care for their every need as long as they're not doing this one thing because death will enter if they do this one thing. But I want to tell you, their trust in God, whether or not he meant what he said, was where the serpent enters the picture, and he begins to cast doubt in their minds on the goodness of God. He distorts their words to Adam and Eve, and for the very first time when they give in, to that temptation, there is shame that enters the world. There is blame that enters the world. And there is a distance between them and one another. There is a distance between them and creation. And there is a distance between them and God. The consequences were so strong, they felt it at that exact moment as they realized in their nakedness that they were ashamed. So they covered themselves up with fig leaves. They try to hide from God, but God comes looking for them. God pursues them with his relentless love and calls out to them, Where are you? What have you done? See, their distrust in God's goodness led to their disobedience in their lives. If God really loved us, surely he wouldn't withhold this thing from us. If God really loved us, surely he wouldn't want us to go without. But because of their sin, the goodness of the created order was distorted. That dynamic in the man-woman relationship, that dynamic in, in, in the man and creation relationship, that dynamic between man and God was out of sync. The serpent was cursed. 
And within that curse, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we see that there will be this one to come from the seed of the woman, and his heel will be struck, but not before he deals a decisive blow by crushing the head of the serpent. So God is issuing a promise even in the midst of all this mess. Let's fast forward a little bit. Humans cast out of the garden, flaming sword and an angel blocking the way back in. God has covered them over with their animal coverings and all of that sort of stuff. But their problem of sin and the problem of their distrust and the way God was telling them to be, live in this world, it was still there. There was still a lack of trust in God's goodness and in God's word. And so it led to disobedience. It led to the first murder. And those two sons of that first human couple, when Cain attacks and kills his brother Abel, Things get so bad several generations later. We looked at this last week, but in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, God looks at humans and he says that he realizes that every inclination and the thought of every human heart was only evil all the time. Things are getting bad. Things are getting bleak. And God decides to clean house. And that's the story of Noah we talked about last week. God says, Noah, trust me. Noah, trust me and be obedient to me. Go out and build that ark because there's a huge flood coming. Noah, if you do this, I will save you and I will save your family as well. So they do that. Noah listens to God. He's obedient to God. He trusts in God's word and he builds this huge boat and God saves them from the flood. He is lifted up in salvation while the entire world is flooded in judgment. And when the waters subside, they get off the boat. Noah makes a sacrifice and then God spreads this beautiful rainbow over the sky. Now we need to remember something about that rainbow, right? It's not just this big, pretty, colorful symbol in the air. This is God's bow of warfare that he is hanging up in the clouds because it's the same word for bow there that means a hunting bow or a a wartime bow. God is hanging this bow in the clouds as if he is saying, you know what, I'm done waging war against you all. I'm done waging war against the earth. Where's the business end of that bow pointing? Up into heaven. God is showing the lengths that he was willing to go to to make promises and keep his promises to these people even when they weren't willing to hold up their end of the bargain. Now, it would be awesome if that solved all the issues where we left off last week. It would be awesome if that solved all the problems with sin in the world. But just a few short chapters after that, we see this weird scene of Noah getting drunk and passing out naked in his tent. Back to nakedness. (laughs) Now, one of Noah's sons sees him and then goes out and starts telling his brothers, hey, dad's naked in the tent, and they go in and they cover him up. It's just a very, very just weird story to show us that all of the characters that we hold up as heroes in the Bible, they're what? They're flawed just like we are. They're not always faithful, just like we're not always faithful. And the following generations continue to show their distrust in God. We get to Genesis chapter 11, and we see that all the people on the earth that God has told to scatter and to go out and to multiply and be fruitful, they've gathered together in one place. And in that one place, they decide, let's make a name for ourselves. And this is where they build, many of you know, the Tower of Babel. They build this huge tower, and so God sees this, and God comes down, and it says that he confuses their language, and they scatter them out to go and to do what he had originally asked them to do, to fulfill his scattering and and, and subduing of the earth. At this point, I want to tell you in the story, once more, things look bleak. (laughs) At this point in the story, once more, things look dark. All of the people of the earth at this time are still dealing with the issue of sin. Even after the flood of God's judgment, will God's image bearers ever be able to be what he intended them to be? Or will sin and judgment destroy what God made and God called good? I want to tell you this. Even with the downward spiral caused by sin, and it is, it's just like you're circling the drain here. It's a downward spiral caused by sin. God still loved humanity. And he longed to be with them. He longed to bless them. He longed to rescue them. He longed to restore them. And this story that I just went through for 11 chapters, this wide, all of humanity encompassing story, now gets narrowed down in scope to one man and one family. And this man's name is Abram. The rest of the Old Testament will flow from what takes place in Genesis chapter 12. The rest of the Bible, the rest of human history, flows from what takes place in Genesis chapter 12. But before we get to that, let's set the stage with one of the Bible's greatest storytelling devices that many times we're like, do I got to read this? It's the genealogy, (laughs) this outline of this family. And I want you to hear the story of this family. Genesis chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. 
Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. It would be in this unlikely group of people that we see that are not scattered far from where the people had been sent out from the Tower of Babel. They're still living in like the vicinity of Babylon at this point. And it would be with this unlikely group of people, these people who are not exactly the people who have it all together, that God says, I will work through you very, very soon to establish what I'm about to do in this world. You see, the people in this region at this time, not only were they the ones who had tried to build this tower to make this name great for themselves, but they are also pagan, worship, pagan God-worshiping people, not the God who created the world, not the God who breathed life into mankind, not the God who sustained everything, who called Noah and saved him, not the God who would very soon call Abram. They worshiped other gods, but yet God is about to speak to one of them and give a call upon his life that would change the course of our lives today. But before we get to chapter 12, did you pay special attention to a, a family member that got called out, Sarai? She gets called out for a not-so-subtle reason. We're told that she is childless. She's unable to conceive. And in those days, that was a huge issue, and that's why the biblical writer puts that in there. You see, in, in those days, it was thought that women could not contribute to society unless they were able to pass on the male's family line. She couldn't have child, a child, let alone a son. And so this special attention is dropped on her to show us the goodness that is about to come because of God. And that's the backdrop for where many of you may be read this week in Genesis chapter 12, the story of Abram. Let's pick up what God is about to do, reading verses 1 through 4, chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So God makes Abram some amazing promises, and I want you to catch these promises. God is saying to him, though childless, I will do it. I will make you into a great nation. Though the people that you have come from in Babylon, they tried to make a great name for themselves, God says, I will make your name great. Um, God says, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. And more importantly, all people on earth will be blessed through you. You're going to be hard-pressed to find someone outside of Jesus that has their name on more pages or more passages of Scripture than Abraham. You're going to be hard-pressed to find somebody throughout Scripture who figures into the story of Scripture more so than Jesus Christ himself. Knowing the story of Abraham and what God is up to through him in this chapter and beyond, it is essential to understanding many parts of the story of God in the Bible. But here in the beginning, Abraham is what? He's just Abram. He's older. He's, he's, he's childless. And he just hears a simple call from, from God to go. And we're told that Abram goes. He goes. He steps out in faith. I just love that passage of Scripture. It doesn't give him deliberating. It doesn't give him debating. It doesn't give him being like, well, God, what about this? Or God, what about that? It just says what? So Abram went. He just goes. He goes out. These promises here frame the entire biblical story. And it's pretty incredible that all of this began with a 75-year-old man who has no kids. If I was in their shoes, <laughs> if many of us were in their shoes, it would have been difficult for us to believe that this could or would happen. God calls. It doesn't make much sense to us, but Abram trusts and Abram goes. And we're not told that he had much to go on or much to rely on, but maybe it's that repetition over and over and over again that we read in those four verses. God says what over and over? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, over and over. And with each and every promise of God saying, I will do this, or God saying, I will do that, we are inching ever so closer to the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God promises to crush the serpent's head. That symbol of evil, that symbol of sin, that symbol of death upon this world, we're inching closer to that fulfillment, that ultimate promise of rescue and salvation. God was going to deal with the punishment the way only he could. And we're inching ever closer to that. Why does God call Abram? It's not because he's perfect. He didn't call him because he had it all together. God looks at this family. He looks at their age. He looks at the simple fact that they have no heir to carry on this family line. And God says, I want you to be my people. And through you, I will form a people 
and I will bless all people through you. See, a lot like Noah, where he was just chosen, finding favor with God, this is a story of the promise of grace. It's not earned. It's not worked for. This is God fulfilling his purposes and his promises in only the way that he could. He promises him descendants, a child, an heir. And ultimately, the promise through Abram's family line, it wouldn't be carried out from his son. It wouldn't be carried out from the son who would come from their family, but from the son of God who would conquer both sin and death forever. And that's being set right here in Genesis chapter 12. If you will, if you could, flip just a couple pages over with me. Genesis chapter 15. I don't know if you're on your phone. It's just a couple little buttons. If you're on the screen, mom's got that covered for you. If you've got a physical Bible, don't get a paper cut. But we're flipping a couple pages, but we're flipping 10 years in the story. 10 years probably since that initial promise. Still no kids to speak of. <laughs> Abram at this point has almost lost his wife to the Pharaoh. Line, half line, saying she was a sister when in effect she was really his half sister. I mean, it's, it's a weird story. <laughs> He has a land dispute with his nephew, Lot. Not only that, he's gone to war with four kings, but there's still no child. There's still no promise. There's no nation. There's no descendant to come from. Ten years of waiting on the promise of God. How many of us have found ourselves at this point before in between the promise and the what? The fulfillment. You ever found yourself there? In between God's promise to you and your fulfillment? Well, that's where Abram is. No resolution yet to this promise. How obedient are we in the times in between? How strong is our love? God, I love you wholeheartedly. Well, wait, I don't know about that. <laughs> How much do we trust God in the gaps in our lives? That's what Abram is having to wrestle with. That's what he's having to deal with. And he has a conversation with God about it. He speaks to God about it in Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield your very great reward. So God's speaking good stuff here. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about this stuff. I am your reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Very subtly there, Abram is trying to take the promise into his own hands. Very subtly there, he is trying to tell God, God, I know this is your plan, but maybe it could work out like this. Maybe this is plan B. Maybe this is plan C. But God doubles down. And God says, no, plan A is my plan, and it's, it's the one you need to go with. And so God says to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. If we were as open and as honest in our lives as Abram is with God right here, there are probably times we may admit that the promises of God, they, they don't look too promising to us. In the midst of Abram's doubt, he speaks to God about it. In the midst of Abram's doubt, he calls out to God about, about his trouble. But God, once more, he, he doubles down on that promise. He says, Abram, not only are you going to have a son, not only are you going to have descendants, not only will there be this nation, but they're going to be uncountable. They're going to be just number without end. You can't even imagine what I'm about to do. So Abram believed. He believed. I love those two passages of Scripture together. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, where so Abram went. And then right here, after all of this big stuff that God is talking to, just as Abram believed. He simply believed. Then something amazing happens. It's, it's weird. It's, it's some wild imagery, but let's read this story together. Genesis chapter 15, let's start in verse 7. God also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? He's still questioning, still wondering, how is this going to be? I believe you, but how is it going to happen? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. 
In the 14th generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Now when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites, all the ites. God is giving you and your descendants this land. Now this is a weird picture and a weird scene. Animal carcasses, uh, torches and fire pots and thick and troubling darkness, all this sort of stuff. But this was actually a pretty well-known ceremony within those days and within that region. This was the symbolism of a covenant. You remember last week we talked about a covenant where God made this promise with Noah. It's a binding agreement between two parties. And this exact ceremony, kings, if they were having a border dispute, they would make a treaty and they would do this ceremony. Um, fathers of, of brides-to-be and grooms-to-be would actually do a treaty like this or a covenant like this when their kids were about to get married. The lesser of the two members of the covenant will be responsible for getting the animals, the cow, the goat, and the ram. They would slaughter them, split them in half, put one over here and one over there. Now, with the dead animals here, I know this is disgusting, and the blood just rushing down the middle of the aisle, the lesser of the two, or the lesser of the two parties, or the greater of the two parties, would first walk through it, and after they would walk through it, then the other would walk through it. Now, what this was symbolizing was this: if I break my word to you, if I break this covenant to you, then may it happen to me as it has happened to these animals. In essence, they are saying, "I'm, I'm going to die if I break this covenant." That's what they're saying. Now, think about what's going on here. God's the one who made the promise to Abraham, right? He's the one who made the promise. Abram believed, but he still asks for proof. God gives him proof by setting up this ceremony. This thick and dreadful, this ter- terror of a sleep just falls upon Abraham. And God continues to make promises about his descendants. Now, Abram is the lesser party in this covenant, was the one who got the stuff together. But God is the greater party of the covenant. He walks through first. That's that symbol of the, the fire pot and the blazing torch. That is the presence of God symbolized in Abram's dream, walking through those two pieces. I want you to think about this real quick. You remember how that rainbow was pointing up into heaven? With the business end of that rainbow pointing up into heaven? That's sort of what is going on here. God is once again showing the links that he is willing to go to. God is in essence saying, Abraham, Abram, if I don't keep up my part of this bargain, then may it happen to me as it has happened to these animals. He isn't threatening Abram, saying, you keep this covenant or else. He's saying, I'll keep this or else. Now, if we stop there and we know this ceremony and this tradition, it would be the time for Abram to go through to where he would walk through and also say, well, God, I'm going to keep it my end of the bargain too. God, I'm going to lay my life on the line and say, if I don't keep it, may I be ripped apart like these animals. But in this story, did Abram walk through? No, he didn't have to. He didn't have to walk through because God alone would be responsible for keeping up his end of the bargain. A couple questions I have here. God can't die, right? God can't die? No, he can't. So why does God maybe go through with this? Why does God go through with a a charade maybe if he can't die? Because God is proving to Abram in terms that he could understand that he cannot lie either. God's promises are true. His word is true. It is trustworthy. And he is saying, Abram, even if you can't see it yet, I know it's been 10 years since I made that promise. Even if you can't say it yet, I'm willing to show you the links I am willing to go to if this promise does not ring true. God is showing Abram that he can trust him. And the exact same thing is true for us today. God's word is still true. Do you believe it? Do you still believe that God's word is still trustworthy, that we can trust him? Even when we can't see it, been there. (laughs) How, God? Why, God? Even when we can't see it, we can count on him. So God would honor his end of the deal, would he not? Just a few chapters later, and we're going to jog our way over to that next week. (laughs) You can run if you want. You can go ahead. But we're going to get there next week with this descendant who would come. God would honor his end of the bargain. He would give Abram not only a son, but he would give him the land that he was promising. Abram and his family, they weren't always faithful to God. In fact, in many ways, they were faithless. And we will walk through that story together someday. 
But God ultimately would honor his end of the bargain. The penalty for breaking that vow was, was death. It, it was. But God didn't break it. Who broke the terms? We did. We still do over and over when we sin. When we choose that we know better than God to do the things that we seek to do in this life. When we say, God, I, I'm not going to do what you've called me to do. God, I, I think I know a little bit better than you about the way Matt's life is supposed to go. We break it all the time. But the penalty's already been paid. You see this weird scene in the middle of the story of Abram before he becomes Father Abraham, who had many sons, and I am one of them, and so are you, so let's just praise the Lord. In the, in the middle of this weird scene, in the middle of this story, God is pointing us to the death of his son on the cross, taking the blame that we deserve so that we could be made whole, so that we could receive the blessings that were promised to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, so that we could receive the promises that were given to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, so we could receive the promises that were given to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, so you and I can receive all the promises of Scripture, not because of anything we have done. In fact, we don't deserve it, but because of what Jesus has done. God is still faithful to fulfill His promises to us. God is never faithless, even if at times we are. You know, like Abram, like so many others throughout the story of the Bible, we have been called by God. We have been called out by God. We don't have to have it all together. Abram didn't. Noah didn't. I sure don't. The heroes of your faith that you look up to in your lives from years gone back, they didn't have it all together either. All they did was accept the call of God. And when God said go, they went. When God said believe, they believed. We don't have to be flawless. We don't have to have everything exactly as we think it should be. When God calls, we simply believe that he'll keep his end, no matter the circumstances. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, it says to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For what? Because you're so good at it. No, because the one who promised us is faithful. It's not about us, it's about him. Like, if we swerve, of course, Abram swerved. Moses, all people, through the story of God. But God is faithful to forgive and put us back on track when we swerve. Lovingly, obediently walking with Him and trusting His care and His plan for our lives. I ask this morning, is there some area of your life, maybe it's huge, maybe it's little, anywhere in between, and you're doubting that God is at work in that situation? I want to tell you, doubt Doubt's not a sin. We can wrestle, we can struggle, but we should not allow those things to take us away from God. When we question, when we ask, when we wonder, all of those things should drive us to God and not away from Him. I invite you this morning in a time of response to seek Him for answers this morning to your nagging concerns and doubts. Maybe they're overwhelming in your life, but once you seek Him, trust in the answer He provides. Trust in his call upon your life. And then like Abram, walk in it. It's not enough to know it. You walk in it. Knowing that he goes with you each and every step of the way, even if you can't see that next step, God's there with you in the midst of it, faithfully guiding you, faithfully seeing you through. You see, the main call, the main call that God has made upon all of our lives is that call to trust in the promise of salvation. From the promises of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, all the way through Abram and on down through the generations of descendants, God's blessings for the entire world. The solution that we started talking about at the beginning, what's wrong with this world? How do we fix it? Well, the solution has been provided for us. Where all of our Old Testament characters were flawed, Jesus was perfect. Always obediently walking the road that his father called him to walk. But that road that led him to the cross for your sin and my sin would not be the end. Because he was raised to life so that we could be raised to new life. Free from sin. Free from guilt. Free from shame. Free to walk with him in this life. Our call, simply like Abram's, believe it. In the story of our lives, when God calls us, will it say, so Matt went. <laughs> So Chase went. So any of us went. We believed and God credited it to us as righteousness. Make sure when God calls you, even if it's a call to surrender your all to Him, you obey that call.
a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he understood the costly nature of obedience to God. He, he, he was around during a wartime Germany, and he looked at the, the, the German Reich and the church that they had put in place of, of God's church, and, and, and he, he was opposed to their ideology. See, Bonhoeffer rejected all the practices of the Nazi regime, and it eventually cost him his life, but he wrote a book about discipleship, a book about obedience to Jesus, even in the face of overwhelming odds. It's clearly something that he lived out in his life. But he wrote this, whenever Christ calls, his call leads us to death. Whether we, like the first disciples, must leave house and vocation to follow him, or whether with, with Luther we leave the monastery for a secular vocation, in both cases the same death awaits us. Namely, death in Jesus Christ, the death of our old self caused by the call of Jesus. See, that's why baptism is such a powerful symbol of this life, this new life. That death to sin, death to the old way of life. But when we break from the surface, what is it? New life with Him. All through the Bible and for centuries after, up to us today and beyond us, God's call is always to one of obedience and love. But it's also a call to surrender and it's a call to die. Abram had to leave all he knew to follow God's call. It cost him everything. Abram didn't even know the name of Jesus yet. <laughs> didn't even have that second half of the Bible that we hold so dear. He believed God was trustworthy. He believed that what God was calling him to was worth it. God didn't lay it all out, but Abram obeyed. If you're a follower of Jesus, he has called you to obey him. We know that's not always easy, but we know we have the Spirit of God who helps us to do that. God doesn't ask us for anything more than he has been willing to give, does he not? The ultimate cost, that penalty for our guilt and for our shame, it's already been paid by Jesus. Already been paid on your behalf and my behalf by Jesus Christ. We're going to sing about that this morning if you all want to go ahead and come forward. In these moments before we close up in prayer, and we, I'm inviting you to stick around for a time of baptism. We got one this morning. Maybe you just need to pray and reflect this morning on, on your doubts, on your concerns for God's call on your life. Maybe this morning you just need to say, God, I wholeheartedly place my life in your hands. Whatever you're asking me to do, God, I'll do it. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'll do it. Maybe this morning you just need to just spend some time just praising Jesus for what he has already done. This is your time. Use it however he leads you to use it. If you'll stand with me right now, Trevor and Hallie are going to lead us in a song. These altars are open. Feel free to use them.